Would anyone like to take bets as to what we're going to talk about this evening? If always taking aim at the elephant in the room makes me an elephant poacher, then I guess I will be guilty as charged. But whenever there's confusion, whenever there's distortion, when there's all sorts of murmuring going on, I think that it is then above all that we ought not to avoid such issues, but go right to the heart of the matter and get clarity to cut through all of the confusion and the distortion. Because even if we can only arrive at the truth with some difficulty, it will be worth every bit of effort that we put into it. And so, before we jump into marriage, divorce, adultery, all of that stuff, I think that we should begin with a very basic question. A question which I think for most of human history was fairly obvious, but now seems rather dubious. And that is this. Is human sexuality, which is written upon our bodies by God, is that something that is essential to our relationship with Him? Or is that just a detail, an accessory? Is it accidental? Is it possible that what we do in that area doesn't really matter as long as our minds or our hearts are given over to God? So is human sexuality, is it essential to our relationship with Him? Or is it simply accidental? And perhaps we can bring this into even sharper focus by contrasting it with an attitude that has been rather prevalent since, let's say, the 60s onward, in the sexual revolution in general. And this attitude, admittedly, was rather effectively caricatured in certain political cartoons. They often look something like this. If you don't know what a bishop's mitre is, it is the pointy hat that a bishop wears. And in some of these cartoons, it would say, get the church out of the bedroom. And you would have a little mitre prudently peeping up by the marriage bed. Okay, is there any legitimacy to that? Well, let us have God weigh in on the subject for a moment. Let us see if God has, in fact, had much to say about this throughout all of salvation history. We just heard in the first reading the creation story of Adam and Eve. We heard about their complementarity and the great joy that was brought to Adam. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. We heard in the Gospel that in the beginning this was part of God's design, that male and female would complement each other and that they would come together. Now if we fast forward just a little bit beyond this story, still in the first chapters of Genesis, ask yourself what is one of the first effects, one of the first bits of fallout that's recorded in Scripture as a result of sin, even before Cain and Abel come on the scene? One of the first things that Scripture reports in this terrible aftermath of the first sin is this. When God asks Adam, how did you know that you were naked? Adam felt shame. And that was the first bit of fallout. Because God saw all that he had made and it was good. And he creates nothing shameful. So if all of a sudden Adam is feeling shame and realizes that he's naked, something is wrong. One of the first things that he felt was a violent movement, something unhealthy in his passions. Something has been terribly ruptured in his relationship with Eve. And so the very first thing that he realizes is, oh my goodness, I am naked. Something that he would have taken no note of had sin not just entered into the scene and began to taint everything, to blacken it. If we forward just a little bit further, still in the early chapters of Genesis. We hear a significant event after the great flood. When Noah and his family begin repopulating the earth, one of the first things that is said, one of the first great sins that happens, is that Noah's son Ham does not cover his father's nakedness. Now, Scripture often speaks rather discreetly, and so it doesn't tell us exactly what happened. But I don't think it was the case that Ham just walked in and saw dad sunbathing. What some exegetes have put forward is that what it's referring to in a rather circumspect fashion is maternal incest on the part of Ham. But here we are. This is one of the second great episodes early on in salvation history. And it has to do with sexual sin. We know well of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then one of the most famous incidences in Old Testament history, David and Bathsheba. 
And interestingly enough, just a few weeks ago, we had that reading from James where it was saying, whence come wars? Is it not from your passions? And here we see scripture, we see God making an explicit connection when he tells David, he says, for my part I have forgiven you your sin, but know that on account of this the sword will never depart from your house. That what David did was so grievous that he's setting up a whole string of violence that's going to last for generations. And we see the dominoes start tipping very quickly, especially with his son Solomon and his thousand wives, and then the rupturing of the unity of the house of Israel. And it just goes from bad to worse from there on out. If we fast forward further, one of the most significant characters in all of salvation history, who interestingly enough stands right at the threshold between the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Old Covenant and the New, it's John the Baptist. And what was it that ultimately was the demise of John the Baptist? Was it not his preaching against the invalid marriage of Herod to Herodias, who was married to Herod's brother? And I think that John the Baptist is as contemporary as ever. Because take stock of these facts for just a moment. What was John's primary mission? Was he not the forerunner of the Messiah? was not his whole mission, the whole purpose of his existence, the reason that he had leapt in the womb as Mary visited Elizabeth those 30 years ago. It was to prepare the way of the Lord and to prepare people with a baptism of repentance to point out the Lamb of God. As he said to his own disciples, behold the Lamb of God, there he goes. And you can almost hear the voices of the Catholic cynics and critics, saying then, as they do now, John, why bother with that? That's none of your business. Your job is to talk about the Messiah, talk about man's need for love. Why, why bother with this whole Herod thing? Focus on Christ. Just worry about that. And yet somehow, John, who had been specially appointed by providence to prepare the way of the Lord, certainly expends great effort and finds it terribly important to call out Herod on this one and to make an example of this because this is part of preparing the way of the Lord. What God is coming to do is precisely to restore and heal these broken relationships. And Herod, as an example to all of the people, is doing something quite antithetical to that. And so, so important is it to John that he is willing to be imprisoned for it and ultimately he will lose his head, as we well know. And as history has a way of repeating itself, there are a number of other John the Baptists that recur throughout Christian history. To take just one of them, St. John Fisher, a bishop and a cardinal at the time of Henry VIII. And Henry VIII wanted to divorce his first wife and take a second. And interestingly enough, on account of the weakness of most of the churchmen, John Fisher was one of the only priests, one of the only bishops in England that would oppose him and say, this cannot stand. This will not be in God's eyes. And John Fisher lost his own head. And then, of course, Henry went on not only to divorce his first wife, but his second, third, fourth, and so on, and each of them lost their heads. It didn't turn out well for them, and it turned out even worse for the Catholic Church as most of England was led into schism from that point onward. Because Henry was going to hear it from no one, God included. And he appointed himself the head of the church from that point forward. Now with a brief bit of historical context, let us put a bookmark there and move over and ask a new question. What is the difference between Old Testament sacraments and New Testament sacraments? A little pop quiz. It should be very easy. The Old Testament sacraments were signs, and that is it. They were signs that pointed to something else, but they could not affect the reality in themselves. Whereas the sacraments of the new covenant, the definitive sacraments to which the old simply pointed and foreshadowed, these are both signs that also, as the catechism says, confer the grace that they signify. So they don't simply point, but they also do. And we can see throughout the Old Testament all sorts of little foreshadowings and signs. So some of the more well-known ones, the crossing through the Red Sea, 
This was a sign of baptism. But for those crossing through the Red Sea, it didn't affect sanctifying grace in itself, the way that everybody that is reborn at that font experiences. Likewise, there's all sorts of signs for the Most Holy Eucharist. We have the Passover lamb, the manna, the manna in the desert, or the bronze serpent that Moses lifted up in the Exodus. And yet all of these were just partial signs, shadows, foreshadowings of the fullness that was to be definitively established. The real presence of Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Holy Eucharist. And so you might be anticipating where this is going. There was also an ancient sign, the creation of male and female, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And this was destined to be a great sign. But before the full reality could be established, we see that in the course of history, there's lots of things that mar that sign, that taint it, that make it imperfect. They're only anticipations of the fullness which is to come. And so to single out the two biggest, it would be polygamy, the patriarchs, and some of the future leaders and kings, Solomon especially, had many, many wives. And then, of course, as our Lord points out specifically, divorce. As he tells the Pharisees, because of the hardness of your hearts, Moses told you this. But this was not part of God's plan. And now I have come to restore, to heal, and to make all things new. And so what was just a sign, but did not yet have the power, I am infusing with that power. Henceforth, amongst those who have been reborn of water and the Spirit, those who have been baptized, those who have put on Christ, those who share in my power, now it will be no longer just a sign. It will be a life-giving and powerful reality. I will seal myself with a sacred bond that no man may separate this union. And so just as the other things were signs, as the Red Sea foreshadowed the reality of baptism, as the manna in the desert foreshadowed the body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist, so too did these imperfect signs of marital union find their completion in the sacrament which Christ has definitively established. Now, if we think that the grace that Christ has given in this new sacrament simply means that all spouses will stay together, simply on a physical level, that would be a bit naive, wouldn't it? And so here's the part where we have to unravel a real complicated ball of yarn. We're being bombarded with all sorts of things, all sorts of words, all sorts of narratives, whether it's in the media, on TV, in the newspaper, in the blogs, in the catechism, in casual banter, in what happened to your friends or family or perhaps you have experienced. There's all sorts of things that can create a lot of confusion. And so we need to sort out, very briefly, some basic terms and what the Catholic understanding, what the Christian understanding, just to say what the God-given understanding of marriage is and its indissolubility. And so, first let's begin with separation. Is separation always sinful? Even amongst validly, sacramentally married Christians? No, it can't be. Sometimes it's necessary for various reasons. What if there is abuse? What if there is violence? What if, for the sake of children, in tragic circumstances, there must be a separation? It is very sad, but in itself, there's no wrong in the separation itself. What about divorce? Well, if divorce is simply taken as a legal reality, disjoining bank accounts, getting separate addresses and what have you, well, this might simply be a necessary follow-up to a separation. One might need financial, might need legal independence so as to be able to live their lives, to provide for their children and what have you. What about annulment? How does annulment relate to all of this? And here's where the confusion often gets thick. Annulment can be misleading because it makes it sound like something is being annulled, being canceled, being erased, being rewritten, right? When in fact it's simply talking about a legal reality, a declaration of nullity, that nothing ever took place, even perhaps if it seemed to take place. So basically, in other words, just as you need flour and other ingredients to bake a cake, to make it rise, 
What it's saying is that, well, this, this cake may have been sitting in the oven for, for 10 years. Clearly it has risen. There was no flour there. Nothing happened. And so it's not canceling something that has existed. It's simply acknowledging that an essential ingredient was never there. And so by way of example, we could present just a few factors which could make it such that the cake never rose, that it never came out of the oven. In other words, that a sacramental marriage never happened. Now, one of the essential elements of a marriage is that one enter into it freely. When one says that, I do, it's the most personal and free expression. I give you myself, wholly and freely and lovingly. I choose that. It's not being forced on me. And so things like undue pressure, like bribery, like fear, any of those things that would vitiate one's freedom, that would undermine the sacrament. Anyone that says, I do at gunpoint is not really saying, what the words I do are supposed to signify, which is free and loving choice, right? Same thing with bribery or other incentives. I will marry you if in five years you do this for me, so on and so forth, because now it's a condition. I do ha puts no conditions. It is unconditional, which is why we say through good times and bad, through sickness and health, through any condition whatsoever, no strings attached. Another essential part of marriage is accepting that which is essential to marriage, the so-called goods of marriage. The most basic of which would be openness to life, which first and foremost is in the will. Not everyone that gets married can have children. They might be sterile. They might be too old. And it doesn't mean on that account they can't get married. But to be open to God's greatest gifts, new life, that's an essential part of marriage. And so, God forbid, but if it were to happen that spouses were to contracept for years into their marriage, that in itself would not invalidate the marriage. What would invalidate the marriage is if the spouses go to the altar and say, one of them says, even if it is simply to themselves, I will never ever under any circumstance at any time or place ever be open to life. I will not welcome new life into this relationship. Okay. Now the flower is missing. That fundamental disposition, which is part and parcel of I do. I give you myself and I receive everything that God could potentially give in this relationship. If it is rejected out of hand, then something is missing. And an indissoluble bond, a sacramental bond, does not take place. The last word I'm just going to invent to help us to understand what can never happen. And that would be some sort of desacramentalization. That once this bond has formed, if all the ingredients are there, if the flour is there, the cake rises, it comes out of the oven, if God has set his seal in that wax, one spouse says, I do, the other spouse says, I do, and then God says, I do too. From that point onward, no man must separate. It has become an indissoluble bond. And that is the sacrament of the new covenant. Now what is the purpose of this? What does it mean? Why is it so important? And St. Paul tells us rather clearly, even if it remains a mystery, he says this is a great mystery, but the purpose of this sign is to be an image of Christ's fidelity, Christ's love for his church. So he says, I speak to you a great mystery. The union of man and woman points to this even greater reality, which is the mystery of the union of Christ in his church. And he tells us elsewhere that Christ is faithful forever. And if we are faithful to him, if we acknowledge him, he will acknowledge us. But he says, even if we should deny him, he will remain faithful, for he cannot deny himself. He is always faithful, which is why in the Old Testament, God so often says, I swear by myself, because he is the rock of fidelity. You can never get him to go back on his word. St. Paul also has another interesting saying when he says, we came to you preaching the gospel not with yes and no, but yes alone. This is one of the things that he means. When he says that Christ is absolutely faithful and this is a sign of Christ's fidelity, it's not possible to say yes, say I do, and then say, well, I, I, actually I don't. Whatever seems negative, whatever seems difficult, is founded on that prior and absolute affirmation. Yes, I do.
Now, here's where the difficulty comes in. What if, due to tragic circumstances, spouses find themselves on the outs, find themselves in some sort of scenario where it just can't work? What is to happen next? And so let us ask ourselves, what is it that Christ does for us? Because if we're really honest and we look at it closely, this is the relationship that we have given to God. We once got married to God. It either happened when we were infants or it happened when we were adults. The words of our marriage or our engagement were spoken either by proxy or by ourselves. And they went like this. Do you reject Satan? I do. Do you reject all his empty promises? I do. Do you believe in God the Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? I do. And so on and so forth. What do those words sound like? They sound like marriage language, right? And part of that, in all of that, is that I will love the Lord my God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. Sin is incompatible with that new marriage bond. And yet every day of our lives when we sin, by our actions we're saying, I don't. And so what is God to think of this? Just imagine for a moment that in his passion, that our Lord saw each one of us, all of our lives, every instant, every moment, all of our sins. He saw us say 10,000 times over, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. And what did he say in response as he carried his cross to Calvary? I do. I do. And Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so perhaps in this key, we can at least understand a little bit of why this bond is so important. And tragic though it is, when it doesn't work out as God would have it work out, namely, the way God would have it work out, is that from that first day of human marriage, when spouses say, I do, that that begins a long, wonderful, epic, and certainly sometimes difficult journey, which nonetheless ends like fire tried gold. Everyone here that is married knows that I do is not the perfection of the marriage. Would that that were the case, but rather it's the beginning. And it's only after struggle, hardship, sacrifice, overcoming, and victory that it is truly perfect, that it is finally fire-tried gold. So that at the end of it all, the spouses can say, I love you a thousand times more than the day we were married because we fought for it and we won. And no one can take this from us now. That's what God would have. And yet, because of sin and free choice, it doesn't always happen. But does that mean that God's plans are entirely undermined on account of that? No. And given what we just saw about what our Lord does for us, saying yes in the face of our infidelity, perhaps as the fire gets hotter, so does the gold. And so what does a spouse do? Perhaps they're separated. Perhaps they've suffered greatly. Perhaps they're even a victim of things beyond their control. And yet they say, I will continue to honor the bond which God has sealed. Even if I never see my spouse again, I will pray for them, I will sacrifice for them. Are they not witnessing to the very fidelity that God has for us in face of all of our infidelities? And in so many words, just as Christ cannot divorce his bride, the church, so every spouse, in the face of all adversity, it says even, despite everything that's happened, even if we have had to separate, even if we had to have become legally divorced, I cannot take another spouse, because neither can Christ. And just as he continues to say, I do in the face of all of my infidelities, so too, until death dissolves that bond, so too will I say, I do. The thing that I would like to close on is something just for you to reflect on, the importance of this in our present context. Now, the following is a form of prophecy. It's all publicly approved prophecy, but one that the church has considered very important. And so I'll read you just a few lines from some apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary, which have taken place in recent times.
One of them was Our Lady of Good Success in Quito, Ecuador. And this is what Our Lady had said. After the middle of the 20th century, the passions will erupt and there will be a total corruption of morals. As for the sacrament of matrimony, which symbolizes the union of Christ with his church, it will be attacked and deeply profaned. Likewise, Our Lady of Akita in Japan said the work of the devil will infiltrate even in the church in such a way that one will see cardinals opposing cardinals, bishops against bishops. Something that could not be playing out any more clearly than in our present context. And although it is scandalous, it is certainly something that happened before. Recall St. John Fisher and even John the Baptist. And perhaps most interestingly of all, most recent was that given to Sister Lucia of Fatima, who died just as recently as 2005. She was one of the three visionaries of Fatima, Portugal. It took place way back in 1917. And she writes, the final battle between the Lord and the reign of Satan will be about marriage and the family. Don't be afraid, she added, because anyone who operates for the sanctity of marriage and the family will always be contended and opposed in every way because this is the decisive issue. We can see it playing out in the media, in the entertainment, in our politics, in our churches, and in our homes. The entire church is founded on the domestic church. Parents are the first teachers of their children in the faith, and that is a bond that's founded on their I do, which ultimately is the I do of Christ himself. Now much more could be said, and with these issues often comes a whole lot of complication, a whole lot of hurt and pain. But the truth, the bit of gold, or rather even the diamond that is the center of all of this it's God's fundamental yes. That is the beauteous, the, the beauty, the beautiful, the glorious, the life-giving truth. When God says yes. See, Deus pro nobis quis contra nos. If God is for us, who can be against us? And even if we are unfaithful, Christ is always faithful, for he cannot deny himself. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit.